I'm, I'm actually uh, surprised that uh, all of you are here. When I sent in my description, I didn't realize I should use a snazzy title and some provocative uh, description. You know, I was just trying to let them know what I was going to do. So I said, I'm, I'm doing honor and shame in the Gospel of John. So that's about as dull a title as you can uh, get. So I, I assume you are all here because you're interested in the Gospel of John and what it says about honor shame. So let me uh, begin by an important statement. Lower your expectations, okay? Uh, we've actually had our socks blown off of us so far by some amazing uh, presentations. Uh, I, I was just talking with Jason. I want to compliment him. If you arrived late and all you heard were his last three or four proposals, it was worth the, the conference just for that. It was really... Uh, really terrific. And then uh, Steve, I, that was so interesting to describe sin as self, self pursuing self-made glory rather than waiting for God to honor you. And then the way he walked that through scripture was so very, very insightful. Uh, and it was also just sermonic. You know, I, I, I'm glad he didn't do an altar call. Uh, <laughs> We'd still be there, wouldn't we? And then uh, uh, David's talk on reciprocal obligations uh, reminds me I'm always indebted to him for his, uh, his great work. He actually, uh, that's coming out in, a, in a, a volume that is delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. David knows it. Uh, Joey just, uh, I was just texting with Joey during your talk a little bit uh, about it. And uh, just to help you understand the... What is all that? Oh, my wife put those up. The, uh, to help you understand the difference, David wrote on obligations, reciprocating this reciprocating issue and patronage in a comparison between Seneca and Paul. I wrote on letter writing, a comparison between Seneca and Paul. So as I mentioned to you, uh, lower your expectations here for this uh, conference. But just so you don't uh, storm out and leave, uh, that's my lovely wife uh, right there. So now all of you think better of me. And I put the folks up there. He would never do that. Yeah. Uh, and then I knock one down. And one so. more thing. Be nice to him today is his birthday. Oh. Oh. Yeah. I will take the sympathy. I will take the sympathy. Happy so. birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Randy. Randy. Happy birthday. <laughs> Oh, thanks. thanks. Oh, that's fun. Uh, we've been married 36 years, which is amazing because uh, I would have left me a long time ago, but she's terrific, and some of you guys understand that. So, uh, And I have old friends here that is fun to see. Well, I study New Testament, mostly Paul. See, I mentioned lower your expectations. Mostly Greek and Latin letter writing. Okay, so that's you know, now you're wondering why you got into this. But I, I've always loved John, and I've done work on John whenever I could figure out some way to get away with doing it, and it, it just interested me. And my first interest in honor shame arose. Uh, in the Gospel of John, there's, there's an early temple cl clearing, and then in the synoptics, it occurs late. And most scholars say that John has relocated it for theological reasons, which would be perfectly okay, except nobody can agree on what the theological reason actually would, would be. Uh, and I, I wrote an article, which none of you have read, um, making an honor-shame argument for why there actually were two temple clearings. And, uh, and it's the right reason, just in case any of you want to dig that obscure piece uh, up. Uh, my wife and I lived uh, eight years in Indonesia with uh, Doug, who's been there 28 years, and I learned a lot. My Indonesian friends taught me so much about how to read the Bible. And some of that um, I put in that little book uh, right there, Misreading Scripture with uh, Western Eyes. It needs to have three or four more, three or four more volumes. Uh, some of you uh, could probably uh, write those. And I'm still knocking around a lot of ideas about honor, shame. I'm putting them in some of the textbooks that I do. I've got a new textbook on Paul coming out in October, and we're, we're trying to do a lot with uh, honor and shame, but it's not like an honor shame reading of, the, of, of John or of Paul or something like that. Uh, 
And I'm actually knocking around an idea. I just can't get anybody to write it with me, although, uh, Rich, are you here? Rich, he's agreed to do it because because he doesn't know any better. Um, I, I, I want to do s strings attached, and I actually had that a title before you mentioned it, David. Uh, and I want to do uh, kinship, and I want to do patronage. I'm not going to do purity, sorry. Kinship, patronage, and honor, and kind of trace it through the biblical text. Uh, and I would, I, I think it'd be fun. I, I just, but what I'm supposed to be doing is actually writing a commentary on John, a two-volume, 400,000-word uh, commentary, of which I have already done four words, the Gospel of John. So, <laughs> so my goal today is to kind of kickstart that project, and maybe you guys can help me uh, write a little bit of it. So when you see it later, you'll say, I, I told them that. And, so, and it'll be absolutely true. Uh, so I, I'm learning a lot. Uh, I have a PowerPoint. Uh, when I was invited to uh, do this, they somehow they gave me the impression it was going to be 8 to 10 or 12 people in a workshop kind of discussion sort of thing. And then three or four days ago, they said, well, there's going to be a few more people, and could you do uh, PowerPoints and a handout? Uh, so there's no handout, and the PowerPoints are going to be a big disappointment to you, but uh, there we go. It, so we're going to do a workshop. We're going to have discussion, Q&A. We'll see how all of that uh, goes. I also, uh, Jason, I didn't know whether to admire you or despise you when you said your notes were already online as a webinar. Um, here are my notes. So, <laughs> and they're not ever going to be online as a, a, a webinar. So. But let's get started. This is an exciting, this honor shame stuff is kind of an exciting new discipline. It's very fluid. People are still making the stuff up as they go. So the terms are, it's true though, uh, and uh, the terms are in flux. We still don't agree with how they're uh, defined. Uh, we're not going to get into it today, although I'll taunt some of you. I don't like your definition of shame, actually. I think there's a different definition for that. I think it's a good thing. But anyway, so there's, we're still trying to figure it out. It's, it's made worse because English, it's a Western language, obviously. We're not particularly an honor-shame culture. And when the idea doesn't exist in your culture, then you don't have a word for it in your language. And many of you are multi, uh, lang uh, multilingual, and you understand the challenges. When someone says, how do you say this in, in that other language? And you think, well, we, we, we would never say that. So there's just not a word for it. And so with honor, shame, the reason that we struggle so much with defining it is because um, our culture largely doesn't have either one. Uh, but it's, it's kind of fun. So I'll be using uh, David's definitions for the most part. Uh, but uh, Jason was right that these are lacking, and they'll just kind of get us started. So we are very grateful to the people who have gone on before us, Bruce Molina and Jerry Neri and these other people. But but there's still a lot of work to be done. And some of you will write the definitive thing. I can't wait for the new commentary on Galatians to come out and explain how David was wrong on everything. But that's the way it always goes, isn't it? Uh, so we're going to do, here we go. I'm going to use these categories, ascribed honor, acquired honor, and honor contests. And uh, I'm very aware that these are uh, you know, terms that don't fit very well, but you know, they'll kind of get us started, help us to kind of understand what we're, uh, what we're doing as we, and my co, remember it was a workshop, so we were just gonna kind of work our way through the Gospel of John, and, uh, and, and now I'm not sure quite how we're gonna do that. So uh, we're gonna talk about ascribed honor first. You know, this comes from your family line. Uh, when they say Jesus of Nazareth, that was an honor statement. You know, we tend to view it as just a statement of origin. So I asked Nick where he's from, and he was from Texas. So it's Nick from Texas, okay, which doesn't have a lot of honor in it necessarily. But, uh, but, but he didn't say that as a, well, I don't know, Texas might have said it as a statement of honor. But, uh, but in general, it's not an honor statement. So uh, when Paul would describe himself, Paul of Tarsus, you know, he had a Roman name. We're not sure. It was, it, it was either something, some, you know, their first names were so common they usually abbreviated them, Marcus, you know, uh, uh, names like that. So it was probably, you know, something like Marcus or something. Saulus Paulus. So Saul, he didn't change names. I, I think uh, most people know that now. He didn't change names. Uh, Saul would have been his clan name, and then Paul would have, or his genus name is, and then uh, 
Paul would have been what we'd kind of call his family name. They don't work real well like, uh, like that. So he comes actually by saying, I'm Paul of Tarsus. He's come, he comes from a very prominent clan in Asia Minor, the Tarsus clan. And uh, it would have been well known. And Tarsus was a fairly prominent city, and he was a citizen of it. So he's making an honor statement, Paul of Tarsus. It's got a pretty decent amount of honor involved in it. Now, it's fun. In his letters, he doesn't say that. He says, Paul, a, a slave of Jesus Christ. Uh, and we don't want to misread that as, oh, you know, he's so humble. No, he considers it more honorable to be a slave of Jesus than a citizen of, of Tarsus. Uh, He's connected to the king. Anyway, so when we look at ascribed honor in John, because we're doing John, uh, the prologue asserts that Jesus' honor is ascribed. In the beginning was the word. Okay. Well, I mean, you don't get any more uh, honorable than, than that. And it's ascribed, so it's explained or justified. You know, How do you get away with saying in the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was with God, um, all things were created by him, you know, that kind of statement. Well, it comes from, uh, John equates Jesus with wisdom. You know, Lady Wisdom in Proverbs 8, she stands on the street corner and calls out to people. Well, that wisdom character uh, takes a significant role in, uh, in Jewish literature, including the despised intertestamental literature, which Dave and I actually like. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a prominent characteristic Wisdom literature. It, wisdom is described as the first fruit. If we looked in uh, in Proverbs eight, it would. Is that my me? I just got a new toy and it went off. The uh, it is uh, Proverbs uh, eight describes uh, wisdom as being first in verses twenty two through twenty seven. I think it's the first fruit. So wisdom inherits everything. Uh, wisdom is the agent of God's creation. You remember in Proverbs, you know, most of us skip kind of Proverbs 8. We think, what in the world is that talking about? But it's actually, a, the, the Jews liked it. Um, uh, wisdom is talking, and, and she says, I was by his side when he stretched out the plumb lines, when he measured the space for creation. So wisdom was, uh, was, the, was right there in creation. And the other interesting thing that came out of their discussion about wisdom they would say, well, obviously wisdom was here, uh, so where is it now? And so they would actually have a discussion about where wisdom uh, was located at the time, and they didn't agree. Uh, in uh, the book of wisdom, Wisdom of Solomon, it says that wisdom fashions all things. By wisdom you, God, formed mankind. Wisdom described herself as coming forth from the mouth of the Most High. By the way, that's why... Uh, uh, wisdom was seen as being at the beginning because uh, in Genesis it said, and God said, let there be light. And in Jewish thinking, wisdom is spoken, okay? And so wisdom was there at the, at the beginning. So uh, where did wisdom go? Well, in the wisdom of Solomon, it lived in Jerusalem, in the temple. It said, uh, this is wisdom talking in the book of Sirach. My creator chose the place for my tabernacle. He said, make your dwelling in Jacob. And we assume he meant by that the, the temple. Uh, in Sirach it says, in the holy tabernacle I ministered before him, meaning God. Thus in the beloved city he, God, gave me wisdom a resting place, and Jerusalem was my domain. So according to Sirach, wisdom lived in the temple. Okay. Now of course, that's going to become a, a problem later when the uh, temple goes away. In Baruch, it says wisdom was found in the law. In Baruch, it says, Afterward, she, wisdom, appeared on earth and lived with mankind. She's the book of the covenants of God, the law that endures forever. So some Jews thought the wisdom lived in the temple. Others thought wisdom lived in Torah, in the law. Okay. Uh, First Enoch said, it's not in either place. Okay. Um, wisdom couldn't find a place to dwell. This is a great quote out of First Enoch. Probably one you don't read all that often. It's a great book. In First Enoch, uh, wisdom doesn't find a place. It says, wisdom could not find a place in which she could dwell. Then wisdom went out to dwell among the children of the people, but she found no dwelling place. So wisdom returned to her place, and she settled permanently among the angels. So in, in uh, First Enoch, it said, wisdom looked around, said there's no place worth living here, and so went back to the heavenlies. So one of the discussions they had is that wisdom 
who created, helped God create the world, um, where is wisdom to be found? And John answers the question. Okay, in the beginning was the Word. Why would he describe Jesus as the Word? Because that was wisdom. That was what was creating the Creator. You know, a lot of times we say, well, you know, the, the Greeks use that term too. Yeah, but he's not doing Greek stuff. He's doing Jewish wisdom stuff here. In the beginning was the Word, right? And the Word tabernacled among us in verse 4. Okay became flesh and... Thank you. I'm glad somebody else's phone went off and not just mine. It's terrible. Um, so, uh, in, in John's mind, wisdom was found in Jesus, which means, you know, he's making this huge honor claim for Jesus. By the way, if, if you look in wisdom literature, wisdom is also described as a door, as a shepherd, as the way. Any of those terms sound kind of familiar? Okay, so John is constantly tying this back, but in his mind, this is the honor that he gives Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of Lady Wisdom who came and uh, created. All right. Also, John, the baptizer. The one who comes after me is greater than I. It's in John 1. You remember that? That's ascribing honor. Uh, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's ascribing honor to him. Now, the, that's a little bit trickier because who's the baptizer to be going around ascribing honor to other uh, people? Does that make sense? I mean, he, he does come from a somewhat honorable family. His parent, his dad was a Levite. Okay. And Jesus and the Baptist are related. Okay. But they're related through who? The mother. So Jesus isn't from a Levite family, so he doesn't even have that much honor. Uh, in, in fact, when the first two disciples who hear, hey, there's the Lamb of God, uh, one of them goes and tells his brother, and he says, I have found the one of whom Moses wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth. And the brother's thinking, hey, much honor. Okay, I mean, to be the one that Moses spoke about, you need a better title than Jesus of Nazareth. What does he say? You've read John. What does he say? Does anything good come out of Nazareth? Okay, that's not just bashing Nazareth, but the point is, you know, you might can get a decent, you know, builder out of Nazareth, but you're not going to get the one that Moses spoke about to come out of uh, Nazareth. And so actually, what does his brother say to him? Come and see. And I think that's actually John's model for discipleship. Because when the first two disciples follow Jesus, they say, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he answers, come and see. He could have said, oh, I'm right down there at you know, Simon and Tanner's house, you know, turn the block. But he, he just says, come and see. And it's actually, I think, John's, uh, in my first four words in the commentary, that's my first idea about what I think John's model for discipleship is, is come and see. Which actually... Uh, is not really a, a motif using uh, honor or institutional uh, leadership. They just come and see, come experience, come decide for your, uh, come and decide for yourself. All right. So, ascribed honor. There's other stuff I could have done in the uh, Gospel of John, but I'm I'm going to finish like I'm supposed to here. All right. Acquired honor. A life of consistent virtue brought honor. That's what wisdom literature does all the time. Think about Proverbs. You know, if you do this and you do this, you'll gain honor. You'll, it honors your parents when you do these things, which, of course, would then honor you because you're the son or daughter of honorable parents. And sing, singular acts could also bring honor. Um, Paul mentions that I, was, uh, I advanced beyond my peers in my study of Torah. Well, he is claiming honor that he has achieved okay, by his exceptional uh, act. All right. uh, and it's the sort of claim that uh, could be backed up. Right. And uh, we're not going to get into boasting, but boasting had its positive role uh, in, in the ancient world. So, uh, acquired honor. Uh, the first sign, we're told, is Jesus turns uh, water into wine. Now, uh, we commonly hear the statement that sign means miracle. I don't think sign meant miracle. I think sign meant a sign. A sign points to something. 
John picks certain miracles and calls them signs because those particular miracles, he argues, points out who Jesus is. Okay, So um, we water it down when we say that's just a, another term for a miracle. No, John meant these particular miracles are signs that point out what Jesus is, is doing. So in that particular one, I love that, uh, I, I love that story. Uh, where does he, uh, well, you know, he runs out of wine. They run out of wine, right? Everybody remembers that story. So what does Jesus tell uh, the servants to do? Right, fill up what? Yeah, what jars? Yeah, now we need to keep in mind there were lots of empty wine pots. Okay, I mean that was their problem was they had lots and lots of pots that were empty that were appropriate for wine. Okay, and uh, if I was really struggling at this moment, I'd have David come up and talk about purity stuff right now. But it absolutely fits because those jars, are you allowed to put wine in them? No. Okay. <coughs> they were used, uh, if you couldn't have a mikvah, a uh, ceremonial bath by your synagogue, you would you have jars where you could ceremonially wash before you went into the synagogue. And at certain times you had to set them aside and, and let them purify, let them be purified. And so these weren't even good for that because they were, under, they were off to the side undergoing their time of purity. And Jesus says, put the water in that. Now when he tells them that, the servants are probably thinking, oh wow, you know, what a, what a way to kill a party. Okay, we're all going to go through ceremonial baths now, you know, or, or something to purify ourselves from having drank all the wine or, or whatever. And, uh, and, and instead Jesus says, now draw it out. And the servants don't want to tell the headmaster where the wine came from because they're rooting for the bride and groom. And if the, if the headmaster knows where it comes from, what's he going to have to do? We'll reject it because it's not suitable for, for drinking. Okay. So why is this a sign of who Jesus is? Because he has taken what Torah said could not be used and he has filled it with something new. Okay. Uh, and to the brim. And a lot of it. Okay, so he's making a really great statement. Woo! Okay. Uh, because uh, weddings were one of the times that were filled with joy. And you know, there's lots of verses about the joy of the bride and bridegroom and that sort of thing. So uh, this is, he has achieved honor with this. And we're told that people believed because of the sign. In fact, he goes on to say, many people believed because of the signs. Okay. A parenthetical comment, because at that point we've only heard of one. Then the next story, by, by the way, there's an important transition that we miss sometimes. Jesus makes a, a, uh, a comment, uh, John, John does actually, that Jesus does not commit himself, or, uh, commit himself to man because he knows what's in the heart of man. Okay, and it's interesting, he uses the long word for that, the anthropos word. And then the very next line, then there was a man named Nicodemus. So Nicodemus is the first example of a testimony that Jesus doesn't need. Okay, he doesn't need the testimonies of men. Okay, and the first one that he doesn't need would actually be a really good one to have, Nicodemus. Okay, a ruler of the Jews. Yeah, Jesus doesn't need him. He doesn't need that. To, by the way, he doesn't need these testimonies because he has the signs. The signs point out who he is, not the testimonies. Okay, so John's going to go through the book giving us lots of testimonies, okay, and it's a really clever, ironic way that he does it. Um, it's testimony of Nicodemus. Yeah, but he doesn't need it. Oh, then there's a the testimony of the woman from Samaria, but he doesn't need that one either. And then there's the testimony of the man by the pool in John uh, 5. He doesn't need that one. Oh, then he, the testimony of the crowds in John 6, but he doesn't need those, okay? The uh, incident in the, uh, at the Feast of, of, of Water in John 7 and 8, all those people testifying, yeah, but he doesn't need those. Testimony of the man born blind, yes, but he doesn't need that one either, okay? Um, he speaks in the temple in John 10, and the crowd speaks about, but he doesn't need those. John 11, Lazarus, raised from the dead, very prominent Jew from what we can tell from the text. Great testimony. Yeah, but he doesn't need that one. Because 
he has the signs that tell us who, who he is. So Nick comes at night, okay, is that kind of fun? Some of you have been television watchers, okay. Nick at night. So uh, Nick comes at night. I think he came at night because he doesn't want an iron contest. Okay, he doesn't want a public question. If he goes and asks that question just out in public, it has a whole different purpose. And he doesn't want that purpose. He, wants, he actually wants to ask the question. So uh, that's, I think, why he comes at night. And for all of you honor shame folks, that, that seems just very obvious. But you'd be surprised most commentators don't, I don't know if anybody mentions that it's honor. He says, um, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. Uh, that's ascribing honor to him. For no one can do the miracles that you do unless God is with them. So that's achieved, acquired honor, and he gives it to him. And so Jesus takes it. All right, I am a teacher, so let me teach you. And then he talks to Nicodemus. Now, the story actually kind of, the conversation to Nicodemus fades away because that's not John's point. John has now made his point, really, that Jesus doesn't need the testimony of this terrific person. So he doesn't need this male Jewish ruler's testimony. So the next story, okay, is the woman from Samaria, the dead opposite in just about every category. And, uh, and by the way, Nick doesn't get it. The Samaritan woman does get it. Okay, so we don't want to do the very thing we often accuse the Samaritan woman of. We accuse her of being like this, this dumb bimbo. Okay, uh, she gets it. She understands. She's tracking along with him. Okay, so she's actually portrayed as someone who knows what they're doing. In John, the ideal disciples are all the unnamed ones. The ones who don't get names are the ones that we're supposed to admire. And the Samaritan woman is one of them. We describe her as immoral. I don't think that is correct. She's never described as immoral. You say, well, she has four husbands, and she's living one, with one now who's not her husband. Romans had lots of ways to do marriage that Jews didn't recognize. Okay. Uh, Lynn Koek, who teaches here, does a great job with this, that I think that she's probably been uh, either widowed multiple times or probably widowed and divorced multiple times. We don't know why. There could be lots of reasons, including childlessness. Okay. Now, see, a lot of you suddenly went from being mad at her to being sympathetic. All right. Uh, but she gets it. By the way, she doesn't have any children to go get water for. Uh, and, and it may very well be that uh, she's married in some kind of uh, marriage that Jews would not recognize. It's usually done for inheritance reasons. And Jesus says, you know, go get your husband. She says, I don't have a husband, okay, recognizing what he would say. And Jesus said, that's true. You've had four husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. I think John records that little interesting bit because there's two levels going on here. Uh, Samarit Samaritans were a group of Samarians. People who lived in Samaria were Samarians, okay. And Samaritans were the ones who worshipped Yahweh up on the mountain uh, there at Mount Gerizim. Okay. According to Jews, the origin of, of the uh, Samaritans is found in 2 Kings when, if you remember, they brought other people in and they uh, intermingled with the Samarians that were the Jews that were there. And it's interesting, they brought in four gods, okay, and then they started worshiping Yahweh again, but with a golden calf. Isn't that interesting? That's uh, 2 Kings 17. So I don't think the woman is trying to change the subject with Jesus. I think she's tracking his critique. The one you worship now, okay, uh, is not your husband. And she says, well... You Jews say we should worship them in Jerusalem, but our father said you should worship them here on this mountain. So I think she's tracking. So she's arguing, well, which one is the right temple of Yahweh then? And Jesus answers. Come on, Bible folks. What's the answer? You're still mad at the woman for not being immoral. Um, <laughs> Jesus said, a time is coming well, you'll worship me in spirit and in truth. So he's saying, actually, it's not either one. Okay. Um, it's not either one. 
So anyway, the woman comes, and by the way, she gives her testimony. Nobody says, you're an immoral bimbo. We're not going to listen to you. They all come out, do you remember? But eventually they say, um, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Okay. Now we believe because of what he has done, Jesus has done, so he has more acquired honor there. It's a great story. I love that story. Uh, now, ascribed versus acquired honor. Here's an interesting one I was kind of sorting out. When he says, uh, we found the one that Moses is about, and they say, you know, he's Jesus of Nazareth. And then, what does Jesus say to, uh, to the man who says, Jesus of Nazareth? Nathaniel? He says, while you were under a fig tree, I saw you. And uh, he says, wow. By the way, before that, when Philip says, you know, Jesus of, Jesus of Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip says, come and see. Okay, see that little theme there. And, and when he goes to meet Jesus, Jesus says, um, behold an Israelite in whom there's no guile. He says, wow. By the way, he doesn't say, oh, no, I have lots of guile. He thinks, yeah, that's right, I, I actually am. And, uh, <laughs> and then he says, while you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And he says, wow. You, you are the one. Okay. So Jesus does this miraculous act. That, it's an act of, of prophecy. He knows this thing about Nathaniel. And that gives Jesus acquired honor. Enough honor that in Nathaniel's eyes, Jesus could be the one uh, that he was talking about. Do a few more real fast. Do uh, you remember the official comes, my, my servant is ill, and Jesus says, go, your servant is well. And he took him at his word and left. Okay, that's acquired honor. He just thinks, um, instead of achieved honor, do you see the difference? If he doesn't wait, well, I'll believe this guy when he, when he heals my servant. But no, I, will, I, I, I believe him now. So uh, it's acquired honor. In John 5, the man by the pool, it's the contrast with the angel that stirs the water, according to the, the stories of the day, and that Jesus has more honor than that angel that stirs the water because he just heals the man. By the way, that's a story with a lot of, of uh, punch to it. All those, uh, uh, all those injured, handicapped people are there by the pool uh, begging because you, uh, a Jewish law required you to give money to the temple, money to the local place of worship, and then also almsgiving, uh, a tithe to, the, to those in need. Well, if you're in a little village in, in Nazareth, I mean, the, if, if everybody gave a tithe to the person who had busted his leg and was crippled, uh, he'd be the richest person in Nazareth. Okay, you know, so can you imagine if 2,000 people gave you the tithe? Some of you raise your own support. You're thinking, yeah, this would be great. Uh, <clears throat> so, the, uh, so one of the traditions that arose is you would store up your alms and you'd go to Jerusalem and there you would give your alms. So if you were in need, you would want to also make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, okay, so that you could be there to help somebody who needed to give away their alms. See, so this was a mutually beneficial situation. So you, they would do it at the time of prayer, nine in the morning, three in the afternoon. What are you going to do in between? Well, you can sit there in the hot sun outside the gate, or you could just go right on down the hill to the pool that had covered porches and rest there in the shade until your three o'clock shift. And, uh, and also there was this story that if the water was stirred, you could be healed, but at least it gave you a cool place to rest. So Jesus goes down there, walks past everybody that needs help, including probably lots of people who asked for help. And he offers it to the person who doesn't ask for help. Isn't that interesting? Um, and the person, by the way, is, is not grateful. Um, he doesn't reciprocate uh, appropriately. And uh, we're not really sure why. Although Jesus sees them in the temple area later and tells them, stop sinning. Now, I don't know what he was doing. I mean, there's not a lot of things that would be visible sinning that you could do there in the temple without, uh, you know, the temple uh, environs without getting in trouble. My suspicion was he was begging because he'd been there a long time. He was well known. There's probably people who came every year to give their alms to him. And so he, uh, he may not have been particularly happy that Jesus just 
uh, heal them. Anyway, so he does uh, reciprocate, but in an inappropriate way. All right, let's see. Chapter 6, uh, Moses, and uh, Jesus multiplies the bread and uh, fish. That great story. Most impressive miracle in the eyes of the four gospel writers. <clears throat> it's the only miracle recorded by all four. You know, we think it's pretty cool. We probably would have all voted for Lazarus as like the most cool miracle. Um, but the gospel writers, man, they think it's the multiplying the bread that really does it. And they compare it to Moses. Okay. And they say, Moses gave our fathers bread in the wilderness. And Jesus says, it wasn't Moses who did it. Makes them mad, actually. Makes them mad. Because I think he's thinking, I did it. I'm the one who gave you bread and Moses bread. Anyway, but he said, it wasn't Moses who did it. Okay. But it's very impressive. It's a very impressive miracle. And how many does he feed? 5,000 men. And I hear it all the time. People say, well, back then they only counted men. No, they didn't. They counted all kinds of people. Okay. One instance in which they only counted men. War. 5,000. It's a nice round number. Now, we assume it's a round number, not like one more than 4,999. Okay. Who also counted 5,000 men? I'll give you a hint. The Romans. A legion was 5,000 men. Jerusalem was guarded by a legion. Okay. So they're looking at this and they're seeing an army. Okay. What are the big problems with an army? How do you feed them? Man, Jesus can feed them with one lunch. Okay. Not only that, but they're the best fed army around. In fact, John points out, afterwards they want to make him king by force. Okay. They thought this was a kingly Davidic kind of thing to do. They loved it. Okay. By the way, when we look at uh, Mark, Mark picks up on it as well and ties it to the walking on the water story. Do you remember that one? The uh, Jesus is uh, asleep. They're worried that they're going to drown. Who's trying to kill them? Well, they would say spirits. Okay. Jesus, uh, they wake Jesus up. What does he do? We say he calms the storm, but what does it actually say? He rebukes the wind. Now, you know, I don't know. You, know, you don't really rebuke high pressure, low pressure kind of systems. Okay? We say, well, you know, bless their hearts. Ancient people didn't understand those things. <laughs> I, uh, um, when he gets to shore, who greets him? The demoniac named Legion. Okay. They asked to be commanded into the pigs. The Roman Legion, the 10th uh, uh, Fratensis Legion, their symbol was the boar, the pig. Okay. Mark, that's a good story. <laughs> okay. So. Um, you know, when Jesus walks on the water, we think he's just doing cool tricks with gravity. But he's actually shown dominion over the spirits because spirits lived in the water and they lived in the air. Okay, now before you get all smug in our modern understanding, where do they live? We say, well, you know, spirit places. But definitely not water and air. By the way, is it true? Yes. Is it true that Christ came to give us a plan for our life? Yes. Is it true that he offers forgiveness for guilt? Yes. Is it true that he offers uh, honor for those who have been dishonored? Yes. All those things are true. So I'd love to see that 2 Corinthians 5 uh, presentation. You've, you've announced it, so now you have to do it. All right. Um, or you'd lose honor. Ah, the, <laughs> how many times can we make that joke this weekend? I mean, really, or this week. Okay, honor contest. Um, you're all familiar with this. Honor is won or lost in public contests. Um, all public questions are uh, honor contests. There's no such thing as an innocent public question. That's why the disciples, when they wanted to know something, they would wait, they'd go inside, and then he'd say, what does that parable mean? Okay. Uh, so a public question was always a contest for honor. Uh, David uses the uh, term uh, Challenge, riposte, I guess from his fencing days. 
Um, so, but it, it, it's sometimes called the game of honor or the game of an honor contest, but boy, don't let that term game fool you. It's serious, serious business, okay? The, uh, uh, it determined uh, where you sat at banquets. It determined who your children could marry. You could have arranged a wonderful, advantageous marriage for your children when they were five or six years old, and now you have done something that caused you to lose honor, and they come to visit you and call the wedding off. Okay. Um, Paul may have lost his betrothal um, because of his actions for the gospel. All we know is he says, I've suffered the loss of all things. Um, all right. So uh, when they say, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a challenge for honor. Okay. Uh, and it's guarded. It's contested. Uh, there's wonderful discussion about it. It, it follows, I think, uh, uh, David does this outline, which I really uh, like. So you, you make a claim for honor by saying something or doing something. You walk in, you take a higher seat at the banquet than you should have. Okay. Then the host has to come and say, friend, uh, uh, this is actually your seat. Or, but actually they would wait to see. Why, why would you have that higher seat? So when Jesus stands up in the temple to teach, that is a claim to honor. And they have to respond. So we tend to read it that Jesus is minding his own business, just talking to some people in the temple. And these authorities come up and, and challenge him with these questions. No, he started it. Okay, He stood up in the temple and claimed that honor. Uh, you know, the crucifixion is not the Chamber of Commerce award for good citizenship. Okay, he, um, he asked for it. So they would say, tell us, who has given you this authority? By the way, see, it's interesting. They, they assume it's not ascribed. He doesn't, it's not ascribed honor to have it. He had to have done something to have gotten the honor of speaking in the, in the temple. And in uh, John 2, uh, his action looks like a prophetic act. He's turning over the tables, okay? Uh, which, by the way, is not going to cost uh, the leadership any money because the money that is spilled is money that they use for, is a monopoly money in a way, that they use for giving to the temple. So all the people who scooped up coins into their pockets real fast, all they were able to do is make a big offering to the temple in the next week or, or two or three. So the... Uh, uh, and he shoes off the animals to be able to get them back. The one thing that would cause loss is if you open the bird cages and let the birds go. And so what does he say to the ones who have birds? You know, take them away. So he's not actually causing loss to people. He is saying, you've got to get the market out of here. And I think the market was moved in that year. Okay, there was a little, little spat going on between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And so... Uh, they moved the market into the temple. So they're not overly surprised that Jesus has done this action. So their comment to him is a little neutral in John. And John's quotation is about um, the uh, uh, purity. He, he quotes out of um, Zechariah. Don't let merchants be in the temple. That sort of thing. All right. In the synoptics, he's cursing the temple. And that's why you have this dispute. People say, is he cleansing the temple? Is he cursing the temple? I think he's cleansing it in John 2 at the beginning of his ministry and cursing it in the synoptics at the end. And Jesus tells this interesting parable about, I'm going to chop down the fig tree. And they say, no, no, no. Put a little manure around it and give it, a few, give it three years, okay? And then if it's not producing fruit, chop it down. And I think that's a parable about the temple. All right, there's other stuff, but I'm out of time.